You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your slightly irate host, Abraham. Oh, and I have got a lot to say, host Shane. (laughs) We're a psychology podcast. We talk about all the psychology things that people do. And today we're taking on, I mean, this is a topic we have wanted to discuss for a while. And I have been putting it off and avoiding it and putting it off because it is heavy. Yes, there's a lot of stuff. And we wanted to really take some time to kind of give it the room that it deserves to talk about, because there are a lot of people that support this thing. There are a majority of people that don't support this thing. And there are just a lot of things to talk about within this and kind of really, I guess maybe the thing I want to say is we really want to spend time on this and do this topic justice. Yeah. Not that we don't do that with like seizure dogs and all the stuff that we talk about all the time. Yeah. But I do think it's important to spend a lot of time on this and really come at this from a very logical and rational standpoint even though it's very easy not to there's a lot to unpack yeah you know, it's a it's a big topic it's a complex topic if you're joining us for the first time i mean welcome happy to have you here this is almost certainly going to span multiple parts at least two possibly three who knows how far we're going to go i expect to at a minimum because of of how much there is to talk about and rather than drag out a multi-hour discussion we'd like this to be in sort of digestible chunks so we're going to start i think by introducing our topic today and we're going to get into what all of that is Before we start doing all of that, I would like to talk about if you would like to support the show, like and subscribe, leave a rating and review, pick up some merch, join us on Patreon, start an advocacy group called Why We Do What We Do supports better things than what is currently going on. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Rolls right off the tongue. I like that. Uh, Yeah, that's really smooth. So (laughs) WWDWWDSBTTAGO. Yeah, why we do what we do supports better things that are going on. There you go. <laughs> I think I, I think that gets it. So anyway, yes, go start that nonprofit. Try to put that on, a, on an application. And I'll talk more about other ways that you can support us, or just in more detail about those ways. When we finish this discussion, we'll try and keep this as, as flowing as nicely as we can. Now, this episode comes out on March twenty second, and there's some important dates that we should recognize that are relevant to March twenty second. Yes. So today is the first day of Ramadan. Happy holidays. Ramadan celebrators. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. It is as young as you feel day. And and uh, the description of this is that age is just a number. So, you know, you do you. Don't focus on your age. Yeah, I uh, don't like this one because I feel 50. <laughs> and that's older than I am. So that sucks. It's fair. It's a good point. It's Bavarian crepes day. So if you like very thin pancakes with, I guess, maybe uh, whipped cream in it. I saw chocolate, but maybe both. Chocolate rules. Yeah. It is National Goof Off Day, so... Big fan. This topic is not a goof off type topic, but instead of that, you can do something goofy. Yeah, I mean, be goofy elsewhere. Yeah. It's also World Water Day, with the idea of helping get clean water to places that need it. Yeah. Like that. Potables and sanitation and all of that. Speaking of chocolate, it's American Chocolate Week, so go enjoy. Have you ever had American chocolate? I've had chocolate, I assume. I I mean, I've had Hawaiian chocolate. Hawaiian's American chocolate, technically speaking. So I guess that's American chocolate. Yeah. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure if it was like American cheese, where it's like a thing that's not really a thing, but it's a thing that people make it. A sort of plasticky version of it. Yeah. Like, I was kind of like, I mean, maybe like Hershey's is American chocolate. Hmm. Hawaiian chocolate is amazing. I could not recommend it highly enough. So, yeah. I mean, I've. 100% support that. Cool. It's also International Teach Music Week, which uh, as musicians here on the show, we we like that. Yeah, very much in support. And of course, it is still Women's History Month going on. So just to acknowledge that. So if you're celebrating Ramadan, I hope you have a, a great Ramadan. Uh, that also lasts a week. Otherwise, you can get some crepes while pretending that you're old or young, depending on what your 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 shtick is there. Goofing off, acknowledging the importance of clean drinking water and teaching someone music. All at the same time. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, it's a good day for all that. All right. I'm ready to begin this little adventures of our, or this little adventure of ours with a story that I made up. Are you ready for some story time? Yeah, story time. I like it. Gather around, open your ears. It's time for story time. 
we're going to pretend there's this person. We're going to pretend that he, his name is Ross Marie cross. And he purports to believe that Ouija boards actually effectively communicate with the dead. Cross thinks that anyone can be trained to use uh, Ouija boards using his training program and that they will also be able to effectively communicate with the dead. And so cross develops a protocol wherein he joins a family member at a Ouija board together and working with one another, they contact the spirits of lost loved ones to receive final messages, et cetera, et cetera. What a joy, right? Mm -hmm. We always wish all of us wish that we could have conversations with our loved ones past in some capacity, even if it's to say, well, wishes, you know, we all wish that we had one more message, at least one more that we could get across sometimes more. Absolutely. Okay. So cross has this Ouija board thing. He puts this to the test by going to a family who tragically lost their child, Amber and cross gathers the family. He busts out his little Ouija board with his planchette and he, he gets the whole routine going and he, miraculously gets a message nearly instantly. Amber reports she is, quote, so happy that their family went through the trouble of finding this wonderful person so that she can finally communicate with her family again. So that I'm made up quote. It's not a real story. Mm -hmm. She goes on to say that she loves her family so much. She's relieved to speak with them again. It's been so isolating feeling like she understands and can see what's happening all around her, but she just can't get her voice out to actually talk to her family. Everyone is so relieved. They're so happy to hear from Amber. Thank goodness we have this miracle. We can finally speak to our, our lost child again. And of course, Cross, he, he's here. He's facilitating this whole message. He's getting it across using his Ouija board on behalf of his patient, Amber. He communicates that Amber thinks there's really no minimum amount of money that would sufficiently express her gratitude or their gratitude for the translator, Cross. And so asks her family to give Cross essentially as much as they can afford to give him. Thank you for your generous service to our family. Spare no expense. We're here for it because this is our, our lost child. Okay. Now expressing some doubt and hesitation, one of the uncles who's also in the room says, how can we sh be sure? How can we be sure that this is coming from Amber and not this Cross guy? Cross, quick on his feet, crazy like Fox, pivots. On behalf of Amber, he says, it's no surprise you wouldn't want me be to be able to wake up or communicate. You sexually molested me for years when I was a little girl. Mm. Shock and outrage, right? In an instant, the family is up in arms against their uncle. The uncle's life is ruined. He's brought to trial. He obviously found no guilty because, you know, zero evidence. His reputation is destroyed. He loses his job, ostracized from his community. His car and his house are vandalized. He has to move away to escape the abuse. A family friend later also expresses doubt that Cross is actually interpreting for Amber. And of course, Amber, through Cross, suddenly accuses the friend of also abusing Amber when she was alive, sexually abusing her when other people weren't around, etc. The friend is also investigated. Cross doesn't stop there. He's emboldened with his success. He decides to expand his power and influence as far as he possibly can. He opens a school to train fleets of hopeful Ouija translators. And within months, hundreds of people are using Ouija boards to contact the dead all around the country. So in the story, most of us would hear this and see how obvious it is that Cross is authoring a heinous crime. He is using people as puppets for personal financial gain. Yeah. He is taking away their voice. He is ignoring who they are as humans. He is replacing their personality with his own. And he develops a cult of supporters who protect him from persecution because they would rather believe that they can talk with their loved one, then accept they are be getting swindled by a hack. So you can kind of hear that in this story pretty clearly. And I would like to believe that most people would see this fraud and want to destroy it, expose it, relegate it to the trash heap of history and the bad ideas pile along with Nazism, lead paint and Twitter. But that's not what's happened <laughs> or likely will happen because this story did happen, except instead of dead people, it was with people with intellectual disabilities who demonstrate little or no communication. And instead of speaking for them, the translator is typing for them. Yep. This is the story of facilitated communication. Mm -hmm. Now, who is this episode that we're authoring today that we're discussing today? Who is this for? I think there's a lot of people out there who have heard this in some capacity or another. And I think even if you are familiar with the story, if you have never heard of this, if you are someone who has been exposed to this, if you're someone who works with this, 
I think this is for pretty much everyone. We really tried to orient our discussion here to be relevant to wherever you are coming at this from, because we want to both be sensitive to those who have had who've been on the receiving end, on the providing end, on the sideline, those of us who've just sort of became aware of this, who are in a tangentially related sort of field. There's a lot to the story. There's there's more that I learned in unpacking this. I mean, I had a, a lot of history with this topic before we started it, but had to learn a lot more as we got into it. And it is, I'll let the story speak for itself, but it, it certainly had had me emotionally engaged at a high level. Yeah, it, this is... One of those things where there is a lot of nuances to unpack within it, and I think that there is a pretty clear thesis in the story that we're going to tell and kind of like the the history that we're going to get into. As we're putting together notes for this, it it reminded me that there was uh, early in my career as somebody who was working as like uh, like providing services for adults coming across this and just the damage that this did. Yeah, I don't say that lightly because we always try to give everything a fair shake and we try to like really like look at this from an objective lens. But did and you witnessed it firsthand? Firsthand, I watched a man's life get torn apart and him lose custody of his daughter over this. Wow, we'll share that stuff and th- those stories and whatnot. I mean, this was firsthand. Watch this just destroy this man's life. So I have a very particular kind of experience with this. So I have to kind of check my bias as we go through this, and I and I want to be clear about that up front because I know clearly I've got this experience, but it is one of those things where the more you learn about it, the more you learn kind of the challenges that come along and the nuances and really the, the, the concerns that come up with this. Yeah. So let's be clear on exactly what happens in facilitated communication. We want to make sure we've got clarity and agreement on what we're talking about. It's always important if we're going to try and unpack something for which we are applying a critical lens, that we are as fair and charitable to that thing as we possibly can be. Misrepresenting it does nothing for anybody, right? Then you just walk away with less information than you had to begin with. So before making any strong statements, we want to be clear Uh, what we're making statements about. Okay. And so let's describe it as cogently as as thoroughly and as accurately as we, as we can. Now, important thing to understand is who are the people that are in this story? Who are the people that are involved in this? And I'm not even talking about the beginning of facilitated communication. I mean, who they were working with or for. And the important thing to start with is that there are many people who have various cognitive, intellectual, developmental, or other neurological impairments that prevent them from ever developing verbal communication beyond like very simple things. This doesn't mean that they don't communicate at all. Often they'll recognize gestures, facial expressions. They'll even demonstrate some amount of this on their own. They might learn to point a little bit or do something. But nuanced conversation is something that they may never, ever demonstrate without specific intervention and work on helping that emerge. Right. And there's a whole variety of reasons why somebody might not be able to demonstrate that. It could be something that was congenital, could be something that was acquired. Yeah. It could be any number of things. So it's important to understand that we're talking about a a group of people who have at the start of this incredibly limited communication and have a lot of difficulty building that verbal repertoire without, like you said, specific intervention. And we, we get good at language, but language is hard. I mean, if you've tried to learn another language, you see how a difficult language is. Yeah. It takes a while. Right. Like you, you don't just suddenly pick it up. Like language is difficult. Right. So the folks that we're talking about here, not only do they not demonstrate production of language, they demonstrate extremely little or no understanding when hearing language. And that's usually through some kind of behavioral cues they engage with, right? So you might ask them a question and they don't respond. You might ask them to do something very simple, something that's within their repertoire, like blink their eyes, and they don't blink their eyes based on that request. So you find that not only is it an issue of demonstrating language, it's it's an issue of responding to certain language. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a command. It can be virtually a recognition at all of understanding what is being said to you. A simple head nod or shake. Honestly, if someone says something to you and you just stare at them and blink your eyes, you are communicating confusion in some way. And even something that is that easy to do is often something you don't see. And these people who have never developed communication because they don't understand what's being said to them. 
like a lot of the time, like at least not enough to engage in a robust symbolic response. Like we don't know to the extent to, to which they do engage in it. But if you had someone who had language and suddenly lost the ability to produce it, you'd fully expect that they'd still be able to engage meaningfully with hearing it in some capacity. And these are people who never demonstrate that when, as you said, a variety of reasons might come along. And so facilitated communication then was really not developed for people who had emerging or already developed language who had it once and maybe lost it for some reason. There's you maybe have a stroke. It becomes really difficult to engage in language or some other medical event that maybe obstructs your vocal cords or your, uh, your tongue or your oral production in some way. That's not who this was made for. The facilitated communication was not developed to, to help that group of people initially. Right. Instead, in facilitated communication, a translator is called a facilitator, and that facilitator is either a parent, a caregiver, some therapist. There's some provider, typically, that works with that person. Yeah, they're there. The facilitator assists another individual, usually the person with a disability, in pointing to letters, pictures, or objects on a keyboard or some type of communication board. And that can vary. Right. It could be pictures of things that are in the environment. It could be like a like a keyboard that you would type on, like in a computer. Yeah, there are variations of that, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, at some point. But yeah, the assistance is physical, either on the individual's arm, wrist, or hand, or shoulder, depending on the level of support that is prescribed or needed. Or they move the board around underneath the individual's stable pointer, like a they use a finger or a stylus or something along those lines to spell out a message. And we'll again talk more about that later. Or the individual learns to respond to subtle cues from the facilitator. And again, more on that later. So essentially, to kind of picture this, there is a person that has limited mobility, limited understanding of language, and severely limited verbal behavior. And you've got a person that's next to them who has a greater understanding of that stuff, who is considered the facilitator, who helps facilitate or to help out getting these messages out using some kind of board and and having that person point to different things on this board. Yes. So they'll specifically, they'll put their hand on the individual's hand. If we're using a keyboard setup, for example, and they might hold their hand and just help it move around the keyboard to tap on letters on the keyboard. Right. Mm -hmm. They might alternatively have them holding a stylus. As you said, there might be just letters on a piece of paper and they have them move around or like a board. There could be a grid of letters on a board. They just help move their hand around and touch letters to spell out words. That's really what it is. And again, like I'm really trying to be as clearly accurate as I possibly can be. That is what, if you see it, that's what it looks like. There are times where instead what they'll do is they'll have them just kind of hold the stylus and the person doesn't touch them at all. And what they'll do is they'll move the board or the keys, you know, the letters underneath the stylus and have it pause or touch different letters to, again, spell something out. They might also let the person move independently and they'll just kind of be there on the side. Just they're sort of moving, grooving with them. They don't even really touch them very much. They're just kind of there next to them and they're sort of hovering, if you will. And so those are the kind of different ways that it looks that you might see it. Right. And so, yeah, as you said, the facilitator then facilitates typing out the message by most of the, initially it was just hand over hand. They just held their hand and then they, they typed out something on keyboard. They touched letters on a, on a, a letter grid or something of that nature. And that's, that's what happened in the facilitated communication. Right. And so that message that would come out would be something that somebody else could read. It would be a message to a loved one. It would be a message requesting something. It would be the, whatever the message was, it was designed for accessing something in the, in the environment or to be able to communicate with somebody, some caregiver somewhere. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Anything. I mean, it just, it's basically like it's designed to give them language. That's, that's what the goal was. It's limited only to what a keyboard can type, like what letters can create. Right. I mean, anything that you can do with a keyboard, you could do with facilitated communication. That's the output that we're looking at. So there's a facilitator, they guide, an output comes out, there's language output, and then we'll kind of get into some of that stuff later. All right. We blew past in a good opportunity for a break. So let's take a breather, take a step back. Go ahead and turn your ears off and let the ads play in uselessly in the background. And we'll be right back. Okay. So we've been describing what facilitated communication is. And I think that we've 
describe, I mean, it's not really a whole lot more complicated than that. There are a specific set of procedures that are recommended to be used. We're not going to dive into what those procedures are, but when you're looking at it, that is a very broad, but I think very accurate description of what is taking place. And we'll talk about some other names that are used for this because there, there's different names applied to the different presentation modalities, but essentially that's, that's how it appears to exist. Right. So every hero and every villain has an origin story. As a matter of fact, you and I have origin stories. We do. We were both born. True. And there's our story. But <laughs> facilitated communication is no different. The question, though it has already been answered through years and years and years and a few more years of research, is whether facilitated communication is the hero or the villain. So let's start to unpack kind of the, this background, where it came from, what it looks like, what research looks like, all that stuff. We're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time on this. Grab your time machine or your ayahuasca, and we're going to head all the way back to the 1970s. And we're going to, we're in the United States, so we're going to hop a very long flight over the pond, or we're on ayahuasca. Maybe it's quick, it's instantaneous travel. <laughs> yeah. We're finding ourselves, we've landed uh, successfully over here in Australia in the 1970s, and we're going to visit Rosemary Crossley. She's a teacher at St. Nicholas Hospital in Victoria, in uh, Carlton, Victoria, in Australia. She was concerned about these individuals who had intellectual disabilities, who were demonstrating little to no ability to communicate. And she was concerned that the hospital was focused more on staffing arrangement and the ratios of staffing arrangement than the actual needs of those children. I mean, this sounds pretty good, right? I think if we were to see someone who was expressing that concern would be like, yeah, we're on their side. They're trying to support these kids and they're not worried about just the bottom line as the only important thing. Sure. Yeah, I think that sounds on the surface well-intentioned. And I think that as providers, like we have seen places, at least I've seen places that have been like that have had that concern Yeah, where it's like we're more worried about staffing and making sure people are, you know, like, oh, there's too many people or not enough people. And I've worked in facilities where this has been the case where you kind of go uh, like, are you like we should be really more worried about making sure this person is clean. Yeah. Like, why are you worried about not having staff on right now? Like we got to figure that out. So, so 100%, this sounds like hero behavior now. So she asked a patient with cerebral palsy to come and live with her in an effort to find an alternative means of communicating with her. Now, in all my years, I've never asked a client that I've worked with to come live with me. Yeah. That seems a little bit now, 1970s, different time. Sure. Yeah. Right. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff happening. The world is not very great at the time. Apparently, there was a lot of mail bombings happening and stuff in the 1970s. Like, things were a little bit rough. Like, things were a little bit desolate in the 1970s. I don't know what Australia was like. I imagine everybody's under a lot of stress in Australia, given all the giant spiders and the raining spiders that happened. Did you hear about raining spiders there? No, I did not. Sometimes it rains spiders. So just so if you ever (laughs) want to visit Australia, just know. I don't know about Victoria, but I do know it rains spiders. But going back to this idea that she's asking a client to come live with her. Now, the intention is good. I want to figure out what's going on. I want to figure out what's happening. But I've never, again, asked a client to come live with me. That sounds a bit sketchy. Impossible to tell. You know, we obviously have the privilege of living in the age in which we live. Who knows 50 years ago how we would have felt. But impossible to tell. I really have a hard time putting myself in the perspective where I would think that that was a good idea. But again, I've only grown up in a time where that was never a good idea. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I've had the experience of like wanting to be like, I want to adopt this kid to get them out of the situation. Like I want to take this kid. I want to, but I've never gone so far as to take the steps to do that. Like there's, there's never been a time where I've been like, I've always kind of stopped and been like, there's no way I could do this. Like I want to, I want to help this person, but there's no way I would be able to adopt somebody and take care of them the way that they would need to. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we get to a major underlying hypothesis that is critical for understanding how all of this got started, where she was coming from, and all of that. She believed that disabled individuals had issues with language and their communication, but not because of their cognition. She believed that the potential was there, but it was because of their limited physical ability to express themselves. She believed that their intellectual skills were being completely underestimated because the communication issue. And if they could just resolve that communication issue, it would reveal this unexpected understanding and this this plethora of academic skills that were just waiting below the surface to be unlocked and revealed and that that all she had to do was find the key. Sure. And I think this seems compassionate. 
maybe we're on board again with where she's going with this. And I think there's an important understand, like underlying philosophy here, which is that every person that you work with is an autonomous person. Yeah. Like that super important. And I think that that's a super important value to remember when we start talking about this, because if we're assuming like we're assuming the person we're working with is a person that is fully autonomous, that can advocate for themselves, like all of that stuff. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like this person has brought somebody into their care and is not immediately infantilizing them, right? Like they're going, okay, this person. Great point. And I think that's an important thing. And, and, and really, I don't think that that part is all that bad. Yeah. And the value is there. I think it's very easy to get on board with this. I think very easy for us to agree with the value. Now, the philosophy underlying her value it would get my skeptical antennae it, very sure. erect. Sure. They would be on high alert yeah. because the hypothesis is standing on ground that, that has no foundation. So that, that to me would immediately smack of uh, smack as being problematic. But as you said, the value I think is a, is a very good one. I think I'm very on board with what's implied by this is assuming like I need to treat this person as the autonomous individual that they are. And not enough people have done that completely agree with that position. Sure. 100%. So this philosophical assumption, I agree. This is where you start getting into like the science and the, and and again, we live in the privilege of like, this is 50 years later, right? Right. Like, so we're living in a place where we understand a little bit more about neurology, not enough, (laughs) but a little bit more. I mean, we are, we are learning more about the brain. So we have a better understanding of kind of like what the brain looks like today and language centers and cognition. We have a better idea of what that looks like today. Yeah. Taking a step back, looking at the sort of philosophical assumptions here that are being implied, and one of them is that if your assumption is that typical academic learner skills are present in someone's skill set, you're maybe likely going to act in a way that validates that assumption. You're looking for them. You don't have a clearly defined object like criteria for what they are. So you look for them and you find them, right? This isn't necessarily a bad thing. As we've said, there's some implied value there we really agree with, but it shows that there might be a bias toward trying to find an effect that may not exist. It's viewing things through a lens that is I want to confirm my worldview, and if I use fuzzy enough definitions, I can do that. That's that's sort of a, sure. a place. And honestly, as scientists, we constantly need to be evaluating, is our worldview biasing our interpretation of our data or the, the, the phenomenon we're observing? Because it's easy to slip into that. Absolutely. And just to kind of like another like history point here, by the 70s, we had a pretty decent understanding of how learning worked. And so understanding kind of like at this point in time, we had a pretty good grasp on like what operant behavior was. And so with understanding kind of like the the science of learning, we could understand that somebody who has like major cognitive disabilities would have had to learn some skills at some point in time, would have had to learn these yeah. things. So the assumption that that somebody with a physical disability immediately has like the quote unquote typical academic standard it kind of neglects the idea of how learning histories work. And so there is like, kind of like there was a working theory at the time for how learning histories work and how every single individual person has a different learning history. And so this assumption here tells me that she's kind of going, okay, well, this person has all the academic skills and all the stuff underlying already. We just have to unlock it. And, and that is, I feel like a misstep too. Like, that's like where my skeptical thing goes on. It's like the assumption that everybody has, like, is everybody on the same level as far as like, learning histories goes feels a little bit off. Well, and it does imply that if that was the case for, for the, the clients she was working with, why wouldn't that also be the case with just everybody? And instead school is not so much about teaching a skill set. It's about unlocking the code that reveals the existing skill set that is already essentially at its maximum potential. You just got to figure out how to get it out. Sure. And that is just 100% not how education has ever worked. Like we sure. know that you have to specifically nurture and build existing skills. Otherwise, it'd be like, just imagine, you listener, you are actually a virtuoso at piano. You just need someone to come along and just pinch your neck the right way or feed you the right gummy bear or you know, whisper the, the right sweet nothings in your ear, and all of a sudden, you will be a virtuoso piano player. That's not how it works. You have to sit down and put in the hours and hours and hours of practice to build up that skill and get really, really fluent. And actually, I've had the the thought recently, we should just unpack talent as its own topic. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, point being that there's the implied assumption there that if it's that easy to access that skill, then that's pretty much what all schooling should be is just like, you know, do the right, pick up the right tool and you can get any skill happening. And that's just never 
that's never been demonstrated for anybody. Right. And I think further too, I think one thing that's important to understand is that the, the learner that she brought home was somebody with cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy, a lot of people misunderstand that like the physical disability also manifests as like a straight up cognitive disability. And I've worked with people with cerebral palsy who do not have a cognitive disability. They simply have a physical di- disability that prevents like certain motor movements. Right. So like it's important to understand kind of like the nature of the disability that she like of the person that she's trying to serve here in this space. And just understand what cerebral palsy is, which, again, we should probably just do a whole episode on what cerebral palsy is true and what that looks like, because not everybody with cerebral palsy has an intellectual delay. That's a really good point. And it also raises another really good point, which is that if you look at at populations who do have delays in their language, often that are associated with or specifically if you can use the word cause, maybe caused by, or, you know, they're a part of a diagnosis of some kind. Autism is a common one. Oftentimes there are language delays with an autism diagnosis, which means that that's not going to emerge on its own very quickly, if at all, right. unless there is some specific targeted intervention, but not famously known for having motor delays. These are individuals who often demonstrate perfectly fine, fine motor and gross motor control. It obviously needs to be developed, but you know, otherwise they can. It develops in a way that would be predictable via exposure to appropriate circumstances and enriched environments where they can control their motor movements. Right. Absolutely. So as we are at this stage, there's a lot to still kind of like discuss and unpack and all that. But we're at the stage now where Rosemary Crossley has now brought this learner with CP home. Okay, and then we have Syracuse University or the orange of Syracuse University. But we should talk about that when we come back from a break. Okay, so we're in 1989 because remember, we were zipping forward in time a little bit now. We've got a magic time machine. We can do whatever we want. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. We are now introducing a new character whose name is Douglas or Doug. I don't know why I said it like that. (laughs) Douglas. Douglas. (laughs) Douglas Bicklin. So he's a sociologist and a professor of special education. He goes and observes Rosemary's work with facilitated communication when he on, he's on a visit to Australia and he sees what she's doing and he's inspired to bring this back with him to the United States. Okay. And initially he starts introducing this, technique that he's observed with her to speech pathologists and special educators who are working with autistic nonverbal students. But he also initially does this with physically disabled students. However, he quickly extends and starts to apply this simply to people who have some cognitive impairment of some kind, as is described by their diagnosis. Sure. Uh, So he started the Facilitated Communication Institute. And it has since been renamed the Institute for Communication and Inclusion, which I want to point out that change. This title, Institute for Communication and Inclusion, is going to come back later because of the implication of inclusion and how they might use that as a way to make you feel bad about yourself. (laughs) Yes, that is a a 100 percent a marketing term that they landed on for the name of this. So, okay. Brings back facilitated communication. Rosemary had been boasting these amazing outcomes. I don't think we, we said it initially, but so she, I think, had started with something like 10 students. All of a sudden, they were communicating effectively like they never had before. They were in this hospital that she was working at initially, as I said, the St. Nicholas Hospital. They started saying like, uh, this doesn't seem right with our observations. We don't necessarily agree. Now, of course, she might interpret this as you're trying to shut me down because I'm doing a better job than you are. She leaves and starts her own center and starts onboarding people and developing all of this. But there is immediately some people who are expressing some amount of skepticism about what she's doing. Okay, back to Biglin. He brings, or not Biglin, Biglin. Biglin is a hero. Biglin is a different person story. we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> who is different from Biglin in all the ways. Bicklin brings it back to the United States, as we said, with these speech pathologists, these language pathologists and special educators who are working with individuals who have these cognitive impairments, often people who have an autism diagnosis, and lo and behold, startling results, in quotes. Students are typing with facilitation, with high levels of clarity, intellect, articulation. They are bright. They are communicating. They are using poetic, metaphorical language. They are these highly verbally sophisticated people that have finally been allowed to communicate using his technique. 
Yeah. I, I mean, when I see words like startling or remarkable or anything like that, you have to have a lot, a lot of info to back that up. I mean, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Carl Sagan. That's honestly why when people are talking about aliens and everybody's like, there's aliens. And when the United States government has released all the files and stuff on UFOs, they have never once said aliens. They have said UFOs because they do not have enough evidence to call them aliens. Right. So that would be an extraordinary claim with a significant lack of evidence. Right. So when you see those terms startling, remarkable, astounding, all those things, they sound very great. They sound very promising. Miraculous. But you have to have information to back that up. Miraculous. Yeah. I mean, miraculous suggests that it's a miracle. <laughs> and that in itself. Yeah. From what I understand, Jesus Christ was a miracle, and that's a whole different story. <laughs> and this does happen from time to time where people will discover something and it will be kind of like, uh, okay, I wouldn't call that startling. Like, that's cool. Those those results are cool. But more often than not, it's a red flag. And you're going to see that those types of descriptions of results in homeopathy, you're going to see that in a lot of like holistic practitioners that are using some kind of off the market, like herbal tea, yeah. like herbal life, herbal life is an example right. of startling <laughs> results. Um, uh, that's not startling. That's starvation. So when we start kind of looking at these, you have to pay attention to this as a skeptic. And I'm not even saying this from like knowing what this thing is. I'm saying this from when I see that I immediately go, that sounds a little bit sketchy. Yeah. I need to know a little bit more about this. I want to st- dive into this. I'm a skeptic myself. Show me this. Let me see what's going on. Where's your evidence? Where's your proof? And like, let's yeah. talk about this. Extremely common pseudoscience label to use yes. is to call something remarkable, magical, startling, astonishing, miraculous. As we said, those kind of buzzwords, the ones that make you feel something because they're exciting and they promising something big. You hear it and you feel good. You, you know, you want to you wanna believe it because you're like, wow, that sounds amazing. My problems are solved. And as you said, like on a very rare occasion, there are things where we're legitimately surprised at how good something really did work out to be. It does happen here and there. Sure. Extremely rarely. Almost never. So close to never. It may as well be never. Most of the time, people use that term because it makes you feel good and they know that it makes you feel good and you'll buy their product. You'll buy into what they're selling and they'll they'll just keep filling you with hot air or the, their story, I guess. I don't know yeah. how much hot air they're putting into your body, but they're inflating it. So much hot air. I mean, there's probably somebody that does. That's that, You're right, actually. At I know, this point I know for a fact there are the people who do various versions of uh, enema treatments for things unrelated to your rectum and expect that to have a, a dramatic life-altering change. And sometimes it does if it's extremely dangerous chemicals, but not in the way you probably wanted. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really important kind of, I, I would say, hallmark for understanding. And this is just a general thing for pseudosciences and pseudosciences that are specifically targeted to vulnerable populations. So to kind of bring back this idea of a red flag and bring back this idea of startling and remarkable results. Those pseudoscientific claims, the ones that make you feel good, the ones that do appeal to emotion, they're going to rock you even if you're not entirely vulnerable. Yeah. But when we talk about facilitated communication specifically, the group that this being that this is being sold to is a vulnerable group of people. Yes. It's a group of people who are looking for something that they would consider hopeful or they're looking for some light in the tunnel. They're looking for something. Yeah. And when, when they are desperate for finding some answers or they are looking for something to help. And this is, this happens all the time when you're looking for something like that, any port in a storm is kind of the philosophy. Yeah. And this becomes a pretty glaring port in a lot of people's storms. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a light that's leading them to the sirens that are going to crash them into the rocks. That's the best metaphor I've ever come up with, by the way. I was just marveling at it. Like, I've never been good at metaphors, and that was a really good metaphor. So thank you. Thank you, Academy. I'll take my award now. <laughs> I think the, the Peabody for that one, maybe. I don't know if where, where we whatever, fall. In, whatever yeah. works for metaphors. I'll take a f***ing Pulitzer for that. <laughs> That, that was good. No, I, I actually, I, I followed you the whole, I was, I was enwrapped, you know, in, in what you're saying. <laughs> I do want to say one of the things in unpacking the history of this is that, as we said, there was some initial skepticism pretty early on, but that's not to say that they weren't trying to get papers out. They were publishing manuals and protocols. They were doing studies that were getting published and very, I mean, some of them were like bulletins, you know, they weren't sure. peer review. They're like white papers and stuff. 
Yes, exactly. But they were publishing these things. They were publishing their findings. They had citations. They were getting out into the world in ways that we would consider meaningful from a scientific perspective. And of course, we want to see replication. We want to see verification. Scientists out there want to go and ask those questions. We're actually going to talk about that more because what we haven't really done yet, I think, very much is unpack the claims that are being made. We have sort of alluded to it, but I want to make sure we're clear on, again, portraying charitably and as accurately as we as we can what facilitated communication claims what its supporters claim and how it's supposed to work and again we're going back to our fundamental assumptions and the primary assumption here is that there are no true social communication challenges instead when are people who lack development of communication or what appears to be a lack of development of communication is maybe how they would say it it is a disorder of motor control and movement It is an inability to control your tongue and your mouth and your gestures and your body in such a way that you could communicate effectively and you just need that guiding hand. Right. What ends up happening here is essentially the issues with movement stop them from speaking or independently using boards or other alternative augmentative communication devices or AAC devices for short to communicate and their arms need to be guided or supported. And that's... That's kind of the one of the main premises of this kind of intervention, we'll say. There is a, a part of the conversation here in understanding that the facilitator comes in. They're asking nothing of their client. They are like, I'm going to be here for you to help you uh, form a relationship with you in a, in a personal like I'm here to be your advocate. I'm here to help you find your voice is a a way they might say it. There's an emotional connection there. And there's also an aspect of this where I'm asking nothing of you and I'm provided physical touch, which I don't know if we've really brought this up on, on, on our show before, but a lot of people who have disabilities, they get, for whatever reason, completely passed over in the discussion about having access to just physical human communication. Matter of fact, yeah. many policies and procedures have have specifically demanded that support people around them do not touch them, and they get so desperate for any kind of human connection. And here these facilitators come in, and they're like, I'm going to gently place my hand on your hand. I'm going to provide no pressure or demands. I'm right by your side. There is this, you know... There is a human reciprocal relation that goes on there that I think is meaningful in understanding, or I think is meaningful for the person who is on the receiving end of this, regardless of what other benefit or lack thereof they may be receiving. There is something about understanding, like being just there with a person and just to be there with them and for no other reason. Right. One of the things that comes up is this, also this idea of not only just physical touch, but emotional support. Yeah. It's very difficult to kind of like argue against that. Because emotional support is basically what that person prefers in, in what type of support they need and what type of emotion they, you know, like that's why that's, that's why there's like emo- emotional support peacocks. Like <laughs> there's no evidence. I mean, truly, like when you think about it, I've seen an emotional support peacock walking through the airport and you're like, how yeah. does that work? <laughs> That the most I mean, they're just beautiful. caught me off guard. Like the word peacock, I did not expect to appear in this episode. It just really caught me off guard. Yeah, you're welcome, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. But when we start thinking about this, right? So, like this idea of emotional support, like is it comfort for the person? Sure. Is it helpful for the person? Maybe anecdotally, yes. But how do we respond to that as in sort of any sort of scientific way? And anything that we say here, when that person, that facilitator, becomes an emotional support person for that, even through a scientific lens. It makes scientists seem cold. It makes us seem inhuman. It makes us seem not interested in emotionally supporting other humans. And that sucks because that's not the goal at all. Like we want to support people, but we also look at what works. Yeah. And it just becomes a little bit, it's a tough conversation to navigate. What works is obviously in the definition, as I say, the eye of the beholder, but I mean, it's, it's defined by the person who decides what works. You know, they say what wor- by what works, I mean this. And so in a way, what works in terms of being emotionally available for someone, it might, it, it's going to have an effect. Let's put it that way. It works meaning nothing here, but it has an effect, but it's not necessarily the effect that's purported to exist. And Okay, so I don't think that we're supposed to recommend that you skip ads. So maybe have someone hold your finger and tap the forward button on your uh, your (laughs) podcast listening device. (laughs) 
Okay, we're back. Let's go ahead and just wrap this up by talking about a little bit of sort of the claims that are being made and some of the support that has been, or I guess the, oh, and pack some of the statements of support that have come out in favor of use of this. And uh, very briefly, I think we've really unpacked most of the claims, really. They're essentially saying that these non-vocally communicating individuals are the ones who are writing the message, right? Right. That If we haven't made that clear, that's what the claim is, is that the person who's there to facilitate is not writing the message. They're helping the person who they're putting their hand on to guide them so that they can write their own message. That's what the claim is. And it's so effective, you could sort of call it this miracle cure. They're not telling them what to write. They're just prompting them. They're just helping them get control over their movements because that's what they've been lacking and their ability to actually communicate. So I want to make sure, I, I don't think we actually said that really clearly, that that's what they were purporting to do. Because I think you might have heard all this and said, why would they even believe this? Or you might be listening to this and say, no, you're wrong. That's what was happening. But anyway, point being that the claim is that they're just helping that person get their own words on the page, getting their own words written out in some way so that the audience can be able to can hear them, can react to them, can engage with them in a verbal way. Yeah. And, and you're going to find that a lot of the kind of the more colloquial way they'll describe it is that that person was trapped inside their body. Yeah. They're intellectually and cognitively trapped inside their body. And the facilitator has helped them unlock that language to be able to communicate. Release. You hear that a lot. And and you can kind of hear some of the pseudoscience in that. So as far as some like statements of support go, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but we definitely could. But we wanted to highlight a few phrases from the article that shows how great this thing is. And again, feel good stuff, sharing information in a way that's easily consumable. This is kind of what has come out. First one is autism makes it difficult for these students to speak. So they spell. That's one of the issues of support that comes up. Yeah. So some of these are phrased as anti-metabolies, which I think would be a fun mini to talk about what that is. But essentially, these are uh, you think of these like taglines, like marketing taglines. Sure. A lot of these. Okay. So one of them is ellipsis. The boys transformed their motions into communication. Another one was, uh, and this is a direct quote, your mouth is like a limb. Your oral system is like an appendage, end quote. This was said by Dr. Connie Kasari, a UCLA professor in the Center for Autism Research and Treatment. And they went on further, quote, if you're not very coordinated, it's going to affect how well you can produce movement, speech being one of those movements, end quote. So, I mean, I think that if you're not very coordinated, then it is going to affect how well you can communicate and produce movement. That's fair. Yeah. That's reasonable. It seems logically sound on its face. Yeah. We're going to do some more unpacking of this a little bit later. Wouldn't call my mouth a limb, though. <laughs> You're missing out, man. You just, you got to get on board. The, the oh, mouth is a limb man. train. The, the, the fifth limb. That's right. Damn. So uh, there is a statement here. Um, somebody said, you know, despite its success among some students, the spelling net method needs to go through some more testing. We haven't really dug into the results here. So using the word success seems a bit generous and disingenuous, really, but that's something to unpack. And I think more evidence is also an understatement there. But this does, you know, this appeals to the non-scientist and the scientist, the lay person, it sounds like, okay, sure. Like this is good enough that at least we can use it. And we'll investigate it further as it goes along. Right. Like if you have a scientist that's not on board with this and they say, oh, we need more testing. That's a very easy way to get a scientist who likes testing on board. Sure. There's another quote here. Quote, we have a growing body of researchers who are looking into this end quote. And that's from Vossler. And they said also, quote, it takes a while for someone to be interested in researching it. End quote. And uh, I would say, this is something to kind of consider. If people aren't that interested in it, which is not true, it's because there's nothing new to find out. It's kind of a, a weird thing here where, I mean, I'm not interested in researching it because I think there's enough evidence to work against it. But that's just me. Yeah, lots of. And I mean, people have been interested in this since the very early days. Like the 70s. Yeah, since the 70s. So disagree. Here's another quote. We're all movement experts because we all have to navigate our world through physical action, end quote. And this is from professor, professional dancer David Leventhal, who runs Dance for Parkinson's Disease, a New York organization that uses dance to help people with Parkinson's regain control of their body. Okay, so yeah, I think it's obviously a different type of diagnosis, uh, but it, it's trying to, this is leaning on another field that is using evidence-based techniques to apply it to sort of latch onto it and say, Hey, look, we're doing what they're doing. And uh, it's a field of vulnerable people that we can empathize with what they're up to, but it's not 
that's not actually in support of of what's going on with this. It's just sort of referencing here's a thing. We're going to say that thing is our thing too because that thing also or that thing works and because that thing works, you have to believe our thing works. Right. But that is not logically true. Also, I would like to point out, and this is something that I will tend to lean on, is like paying attention to who says things. And when I see Professor Dancer, <laughs> professional dancer, yeah, I know, professor, I know. Dancer. Yeah, professional dancer, oh, okay. professor, professor dancer, David Leventhal. And I would say this, I think what their intention is, and maybe their organization seems to do good for people with P- with Parkinson's. I think that that's a, a, de- a very like challenging thing to, to face. Yeah. And so I appreciate what they do. They're not necessarily a researcher, though. Yeah. That's the Jenny McCarthy argument that they just made. I also, I, I did say evidence-based methods. I actually don't know if there's any outcomes or evidence. Uh, we didn't, as part of the notes for this, research dance for Parkinson's to see if that was something that has been shown to be effective. So I, I think I spoke off the cuff there, and that might not be an accurate way at all to describe that particular method. I think generally we're in support of the idea of things that are physical therapy that involve encouraging getting out and doing some amount of exercise and some amount of building strength and coordination. And maybe you obtain that from dance. I just, I don't know. But I think, as you said, this is not someone who is doing the science to show that we've got support for something in an unrelated field with a totally different population. Right. And just to be clear, I am not trying to disprove or discredit anything that, that professional dancer David Leventhal is doing. Sure. I agree. Like, I want to be clear about that. I don't know. I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. But what I am saying is like, you like, and you just made that, that point. Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe movement works. We don't know. But my point is, is that it's a false equivalency. Yes. Like Parkinson's disease and CP, two very different things. And autism. And autism. All of it very different. Yeah. The last comment of support is this quote. And it's quote, as motor skills improve, communication improves, end quote. And that's from Vossler. And I think we can kind of. You know, from a pseudoscience standpoint, if you can summarize your approach enough for it to be on a bumper sticker, you've won the general population. Yeah, you have basically the three word chant, right? If you if you can say it quickly and easily enough, it's got very, very low level intuition words. It's got very low syllabication. Yeah. And it requires very few words. You have got an audience by default. One hundred percent. Pretty much immediately. Yeah, that's what it is. Sound bites and catchphrases. And if that works, then that's I mean, that's that's how you get the general population on your side. That's make America great again. Like, how easy was that? <laughs> that that's stuck with so many people. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I was about about to say, like, look, we made it an episode without being political. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. <laughs> All right. Um, question for you. Should, should we save our recommendations for next time or should we go into our regular recommendations now and just every part gets its own little segment? What do you think? I think everybody needs a palate cleanser, so I'm totally fine with doing recommendations. OK, cool. Well, let's pause this discussion here. We have so much more to unpack. We haven't even gotten into some of the subsequent research that's happened. We haven't dug into any of the other arguments or the philosophy or the developments that occurred in facilitated communication after the int- initial introduction here. We've sort of just walked through a little bit of background. We have a ton more to talk about. So yeah, we're going to do yes. that next time. And in the meantime, we actually have some uh, a very lovely listener mail to read. We got a message from Celia who wrote in. Thank you so much. And she says, just finished your fan fiction episode and I loved it for a few reasons. Yay. One, I just finished teaching a unit on the novel Peter Pan. The curriculum had my third grade students revise a scene from the novel, which was a super hard project for me to wrap my head around, but it makes more sense now looking at it through a fan fiction lens. That's really cool. Cool. I need to look into the research about fan fiction supporting ELL students because I have a feeling that's the intention behind the project. And two, your recommendation of The Last of Us ties in perfectly. Synchronicity. I love it. Episode three is fan fiction. I love your podcast. And this episode inspired me to reach out. Celia, thank you so much. That was such a lovely email. Seriously. I'm happy to have uh, helped you get your head around your Peter Pan project. (laughs) Yeah. Very fun. I would assume that you're not in Florida because you're reading Peter Pan, which is a a book, the novel, and we don't do books (laughs) in Florida anymore. True. But I do. I got to say, like, uh, you know, having worked on that episode and all that stuff, like it was really great. It's really great to hear feedback. We really appreciate hearing feedback on the shows that we do because we really put a lot of time and effort into this stuff. It's not something that we just put together overnight and spitball like we really work on it. So really, thank you. We're, We're really glad that it had an impact. 
Yeah, this was, this was a great message. It really made my day, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, seriously. It filled my cup. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some recommendations. 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 So I finally, finally watched a movie that I've been wanting to watch for quite some time. And that movie is called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Woo. God. You you said you saw it. It is incredible. Just recently, too. So it's actually really good timing on your part. Yeah. Synchronicity. Yeah. I mean, it was funny. It was emotional. The acting in it is incredible. I think, you know, when, when everybody was talking about, like, all the actors and, like, how they won all these awards, people don't realize that they played, like, ten different versions of themselves in this movie. Yeah. Like, it oh, wasn't like they were one character. They played multiple versions of the same character, having to portray emotions, and just the shots were beautiful, the story was cool, super interesting, weird sci-fi, but, like, absolutely beautiful. And I just am so impressed with it, and I'm so happy that everybody on the on that movie won awards for it, because they really deserved it. I mean, truly, truly deserved it. Man, that movie was full of surprises. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think... <laughs> yeah. That's a fun recommendation. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that it sort of is, it explores the concept of a multiverse. I viewed it very much as being very metaphorical yeah. in the movie itself. Anyway, I, I second that recommendation. I just recently got, so I, I've had this game. I actually don't know if I've recommended this on here before. I don't think I have. I don't think I, this isn't familiar. Okay, good. As everyone knows, I'm a big board game enthusiast. If That's you true. are interested in picking up a sort of heavy, Relatively story driven, high strategy board game. One of my, I think this is easily in my top five board games is called Vindication. Okay. As I said, it is complex. I've had this for a while, but they recently wrapped up a Kickstarter campaign with a couple of expansions, and I am just loving them. They are super, super good. And so the the game is Vindication. The, the expansions are the one's called Chronicles, and the other one's called Villages and Hamlets. I don't want to try and explain it too much because I understand how bizarrely esoteric some of this sounds to people who aren't really in the board game world <laughs> suffice it to say that essentially the board game is a big island and your little pawn moves around the island and as you move you will lay out tiles to explore various locations on the island and then you can visit those locations to try and get points and stuff like that sure that's the gist of the game there's a lot of strategy to it because you sort of get to choose like how you're allocating your resources. Ultimately, your character is described as beginning as I want to make sure I get this right speaking off the cuff, but it's like you are wretched guilt-ridden scum, I believe is how it begins. <laughs> and so you're trying to vindicate your character while as you explore this island by doing good deeds is sort of the idea. Sure. And so that's why it's called vindication. Anyway, I like that. top five. It is a, it's a very heavy, and by heavy, I mean it's just got a lot of layers to it. It's very complex, and the box is also very large for a board game. <laughs> It's like physically and metaphorically <laughs> Physically heavy. and metaphorically, yeah, exactly right. So um, you could do a lot worse. I love this game. I, it's a strong recommend from me if you're wanting to explore sort of a deep, in-depth board game in the world of things. So nice. all of this is divorced entirely from our discussion about, about facilitated communication. One thing we did not say that is worth unpacking before we uh, wrap up this first part of this conversation is we know that there are people out there who are diehard fans of this practice who are not going to be very happy with the tone that we've taken so far and much less so in subsequent discussions as we get into it. I also want to say historically when we've released multi-part episodes, most people listen very much to the earlier parts and less so to the second parts. The second parts of this are where we're really getting into the meat of this discussion. Yes. So I think if you are interested in learning more about what we have to talk about, we have only scratched the surface and next time we are doing the biggest of deep dives that we're probably going to get into in this conversation. Yes. So I really urge you to stick with us and come back for the second part where there's so much more to unpack because although we probably alluded to in a fairly clear way where we land on this, what our thesis is about this topic, I actually don't think we have because we have been, I think, using kid gloves in a very gentle, descriptive way about what is going on here and sure. the gloves are about to come off. We are right. not going to walk away from this without us extolling what science has bestowed upon our understanding of this concept. And it is not favorable to right. say the least. Right. 
So please come back for more of that. Anyway, I do strongly encourage, as you, as Celia did, please reach out to us, email us. You can reach us directly at our, our email, which is info at www.podcast.com. I usually go into a big spiel about how you can support us, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do just a quick on that because I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time. We're on Patreon. Joining us there will give you access to benefits. We've been trying to roll out more of those benefits as, as we're going. We have a campaign right now that if, once we get up to 15 Patreon members, we're going to do a virtual hangout. You can just chat with us, say whatever. Yeah. Once we're up to 20 we'll do some kind of other hangout that will be even you know a bigger game sort of entailed sort of thing so join us over there we're trying to build a community of people who like to chat and hang out with each other and you get to hang out with us and that's all the good stuff Mm -hmm. we also sell a bunch of merch over in a merch store you know wearing podcast merch is maybe a thing that you have thought about doing and now it's time to pull the trigger so you can go do that thing yeah yeah we have clothes. We have clothes, water bottles, a bunch of stuff. Just check out our merch store. Otherwise, you can always reach us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram. I think we're on Tumblr now. I think we're on LinkedIn or something. We're on a bunch of those those places. You can you can find us there. Reach out to us. We're happy to communicate with all of you. That's all great. Follow us, like our stuff. We do publish our episodes to Facebook and Instagram as well, so you can just you know you know do that thing there. But yeah, I think that is pretty much all that I have, except that there are those people who are already on Patreon. And I want to remember to thank them for their generosity and their wonderfulness. And they're a great group of humans, and we appreciate them so much. You know who you are. You are Amanda, Brad, The Daily BA, Joshua, Justin, Kelly, Kim, Layla, Megan, Mike, and Mike T, and Stephanie. You're the best. So good. Huge shout out to our team member, Patrick, who helped us put together the notes for this. Of course, I could not do anything on this in this podcast without the help of our sound person and otherwise audio master of ceremonies, Justin. Yes. Of course, thank you to the rest of our team, Selena, Alan, and Jess. And then, of course, thank you, Shane, for recording with me today. Thank you for having me. I always love being here and being the foil to your straight man because <laughs> you're so serious on the show. Am I? <laughs> no, no, okay. not at all. I was, I was like, wow, I did not think I came across that way. <laughs> anyway, thank you listeners for being here with us today. Please join us next week. I'm, I'm really excited to talk more about this topic. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Likewise. Anything that I'm missing? Anything else for you from you, Shane? Nope. Uh, we just look forward to hearing from y'all. Perfect. This is Abraham. This is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.